ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم and welcome to this eighth episode of the podcast series titled Becoming Bunny Adam, Exploring 12 Rishi'i Discussions on Human Ancestry. My name is Fatima Megji, and I've been introducing each podcast episode, which is an audiobook of a paper that I wrote a few years ago and is being narrated by Brother Justin Mashouf. In the previous episodes, we have discussed quite a bit, and we are now close to wrapping up our discussion on human evolution. And before we continue, I'd like to take you back to episode three, where we discussed hermeneutical principles, which will become very relevant in today's episode. What we did in that episode is we focused on the fact that the vuhur, or prima facie meaning of a verse, has probativity, or hojiyat, i.e. it has authority. This means that when looking at a verse, the more obvious and more often literal meaning is the meaning that we should take of a verse, unless there are strong indications or definitive reasons that permit us to take another less literal or figurative meaning, even though they're still within the realm of linguistic possibility. We hope that the relevance of these principles has become clear as we have been navigating some of the more complicated discussions over the past few episodes. In today's episode, we will be discussing the scriptural evidence for the idea that Adam salam is the forefather of all of humanity today. The answer to this question from a scriptural perspective is multifold. The ahadith are pretty clear that Adam salam is the forefather of all of humanity today, and that him and Hawa or Eve salam are the only forefathers of humanity. However, the Qur'an does not include much evidence in a literal way, except for in the first verse of Surah An-Nisa. Various Twelver Shi'i scholars have the opinion that the literal meaning of this verse, or its dhuhur, indicates that all of humanity today are the offspring solely of Adam and Eve salam, without any third parties to the process. However, they also contend that in the event that there is definitive evidence to suggest otherwise, this dhuhur is not binding to a literal understanding of the verse. What this means is that it's possible that we could take another, less literal meaning of the verse if we have a reason to. This is possibly the most crucial question in the series, and this episode will break it down in detail. Before we get into today's episode, I did want to take this opportunity to clarify one point about hermeneutical principles that was not discussed earlier, and this is whether or not the ahadith that we have mentioned have strength to them. Are they reliable or are they not? And when we outlined the principles of hermeneutics, we mentioned that there are different types of knowledge. There are some types of knowledge that we have, some ahadith that we have, that are qat'i. And there are some other types of evidence that we have that are dhanni. Qat'i means that they are certain, they're definitive, and there's no room for doubt in it. They're established. On the other hand, when they are dhanni, they're not 100%, but they are likely possibilities, and there's room or gradations for the strength within these Lunni type of knowledge, within these Lunni types of knowledge. There's room to grapple with them, so to speak. When we're looking at mutawatir hadith, or established history, that has been established through multiple sources or chains of narrators, this is arguably qat'i, it's definitive, as is empirical data, or the things that we observe, or the muhkamat, or the stronger verses of the Qur'an that only have one literal possibility. These all carry an incredible amount of weight, and anything that is alvanni would be interpreted through the lens of what is qat'i, these more established and definitive sources of knowledge. However, ahadith that are not mutawatir, and that only have one or two chains of narrators, or we only have one or two of these ahadith, for example, even if they are from reliable chains of narrators, they are considered to be dhanni. And whether or not we use these ahadith, also known as khabra wahid, are an issue or a matter of contention. And this is why when we're using these ahadith in the discussion, the vuhur of the Qur'an or the prima facie meaning outweighs 
these ahadith that we've mentioned, which seem to be a little bit more clear. And this is why there is also the ability for us to understand these ahadith figuratively or to set them aside when there's something that we're not sure about, especially if there is established scientific data or empirical data that establishes something else. And we're not saying that there is, but this is simply the principle by which we are to navigate these issues. There are some scholars who take a more nuanced approach to these weaker ahadith and say that even though these ahadith do not give us certainty and they are lani, they're useful in the sense that they can help us build a narrative and that they can be used as supporting evidence or Qur'an. Because the controversy here is whether or not these weaker ahadith can be used to interpret the Qur'an. The zuhur, it's argued, is more certain than these weaker ahadith. This principle will become especially important as we open up today's episode, which discusses whether or not we are only the offspring of Adam and Eve, alayhi salam, because the dhuhur of the verse at hand is very important. But this is also the area in which empirical data becomes a little bit more confusing and difficult to navigate. And hopefully these issues will become more clear in this episode. So without further ado, I will be handing it off to Brother Justin. Thank you. Perhaps the most contentious question thus far is whether we descend from Adam and Eve alone. In Surah An-Nisa, the Quran says, quote, O mankind, be wary of your Lord who created you all from a single soul and created its mate from it. And from the two of them scattered numerous men and women. End quote. This verse seemed to indicate that all of us, i.e. all mankind today, indicated by the words nas, meaning mankind, and then kum, meaning you all are the product of two individuals, indicated by the dual pronoun Huma. The verse doesn't mention Adam and Eve by name, but many commentators have taken the nafs wahida, single soul, to mean Adam, and that his wife, Eve, Hawa, was created from him in some way. After this initial creation, the rest of mankind dispersed from the two of them. This is overtly supported by the traditions, narrated previously, all of which contend that other human-like beings were destroyed before the creation of Adam and that Adam is Abu al-Bashar, the father of mankind. Nevertheless, the idea that we are solely descendants of Adam and Eve is in stark conflict with what evolutionary biologists claim due to genetic evidence. It is this discussion which requires the most deliberation as it raises important questions about the genetic makeup of mankind. A. Genetic Evidence for Evolutionary Ancestry While investigating the fossils of previous hominids and Homo sapiens, Paleontologists have extracted their DNA in order to derive their genomes and genetic sequences. These have been key pieces of evidence used to strengthen arguments for human evolution. The comparison of genetic sequences seems to indicate a gradual change in DNA, and levels of genetic similarity are used to posit human evolution. Human DNA differs only 1.2% from the DNA of chimpanzees, bonobos. The percentage in difference would increase 4-5% to if we were to take the entire genome into consideration. Evolutionary biologists use this data to help inform the theory that humans originated in Africa and that the quote, African great apes, including humans, have a closer kinship bond with one another, end quote. Through comparable genetic sequences, scientists have made guesses as to when these evolutionary trees diverged. By analyzing what is called genetic markers, Evolutionary biologists have proposed which species are ancestors of the Homo sapiens and which are not. Genetic markers are strings of DNA that make up various genes. If a mutation occurs, it is inherited, and it shows up in subsequent generations, i.e., these genes are passed on. According to evolutionary biologists, genetic markers are key to tracking ancestral lines. In short, quote, some parts of the DNA chain remain largely intact through the generations, altered only occasionally by mutations, which become what are called genetic markers, end quote. The order in which these markers occur determine how geneticists hypothesize an evolutionary timeline spanning back many generations. When these genetic markers are repeated in the same order and appear in the DNA of different species, it is argued that they are likely inherited, as opposed to having independently, randomly mutated creating the same genetic sequence. The idea that these genetic markers must be inherited versus unique to a species is the foundational premises over which phylogeny and evolutionary tree is hypothesized. The strength of this argument has been so compelling that some Christian creationists have written about how they were forced to reconsider their beliefs about human evolution after understanding genomes and genetic evidence. 
evolutionary biologists have also used DNA to analyze current genetic diversity within humans and have estimated that humans must have descended from an ancestral population or effective population size of approximately 10,000 individuals. It is assumed that genetic diversity is the result of mutations, and this estimate of an ancestral population of 10,000 is based on rates of mutation. The only known way that genetic diversity appears is through mutations, which are changes in the DNA sequence. This is argued to be a random process, resulting from transcription errors that take place when DNA is reproduced. According to standard evolution theory, quote, the story that SET tells is simple. New variation arises through random genetic mutations, inheritance occurs through DNA, and natural selection is the sole cause of adaptation, the process by which organisms become well-suited to their environments. Through analysis of this genetic diversity, most evolutionary biologists contend that our DNA must be the product of at least 10,000 individuals. End quote. Quote, Tallying up the number of ancestors using this method consistently returns a total minimum population size of about 10,000 individuals. Approximately 8,000 ancestors are needed to explain SNP diversity in sub-Saharan Africa, and about 2,000 ancestors for everyone else. SNP diversity in humans is far too large to result from one ancestral couple at any time in the last 200,000 years. We descend from a population. These values are also in good agreement with older, cruder methods of estimating population size from other types of genetic variation, giving us increased confidence that they are reasonable. End quote. Other methods that do not rely on inconsistent mutation rates include estimating Ni, or effective population size, based on recombination rates of alleles and how often crossing over happens between two loci. This can be calculated and is consistent. These various methods steadily bring up an ancestral population of 10,000 individuals. This is an ancestral number that is much lower than other species because, quote, compared with many other mammalian species, humans are genetically far less diverse, a counterintuitive finding given our large population and worldwide distribution. End quote. In order to explain this rather low genetic diversity, it has been postulated that there have been many bottlenecks in Homo sapien history, and that Homo sapiens were an endangered species for a million years, nearing extinction on more than one occasion. Catastrophic events like the Toba volcanic eruption have been hypothesized to have almost wiped out the human species in the past. These bottlenecks, while definitive as a concept, are cloaked in many unknowns. How small did the Homo sapien population get? Some have argued that it is possible Adam and Eve were the only two humans at one of these bottlenecks, and this is how they could be historical characters. Richard Buggs, a professor of evolutionary biology at Queen Mary University of London, says that he sees no reason to suggest this is impossible, though he is careful to note that it is different from being probable. He notes, quote, None of the studies above set out to explicitly test the hypothesis that humans could have passed through a single couple bottleneck. This is what we need to nail this issue down. End quote. To clarify, while he is arguing that our genetic diversity could have passed to us through a two-person bottleneck, these individuals would have required DNA consisting of the DNA sequences and diversity of previous Homo sapiens. He is not arguing that a unique two-person ancestry is possible, but that a two-person bottleneck carrying this diversity could be. These bottlenecks in early human history have an interesting parallel to other biblical and Islamic stories like the Flood of Nuh, where humanity is also purported to reach near extinction. Human population growth increased dramatically only with the appearance of agriculture and the Neolithic Revolution discussed earlier, roughly 10 to 12,000 years ago. What this data means is that given the way our DNA reproduces itself, it is practically impossible for us to have genetic material only from two individuals from 10,000 years ago who did not have the DNA of previous Homo sapiens. However, this does not negate the idea that we have a common ancestry or that we all share a male ancestor and female ancestor. It simply means that they are unlikely to be the only two that contributed to our gene pool or that they are the sole progenitors of mankind. Moreover, this does not mean that it is impossible for both Adam and Eve to be common ancestors for all mankind. There is support from evolutionary biologists for the idea of a Y-chromosomal atom and a mitochondrial Eve. This is because the Y-chromosome is only passed through patrilineal lines to sons, and mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA, is only passed through mothers. This means that we will inevitably have shared ancestry. 
This does not negate the idea that Homo sapiens come from an ancestral population of 10,000 individuals. It simply posits that all living Homo sapiens have a common male ancestor, dubbed the Y-chromosomal atom, alluding to the idea of an atom, and a female ancestor, dubbed the mitochondrial Eve, alluding to Eve. Quote, in fact, it is highly probable that at some point in the past, all men except one possessed Y chromosomes that by now are extinct. All men living now, then, would have a Y chromosome descended from that one man, identified as Y chromosome Adam. Similarly, the theory predicts that all mitochondrial genomes today should be traceable to a single woman, a mitochondrial Eve. Whereas the Y chromosome is passed from father to son, Mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, is passed from mother to daughter and son. End quote. These two would have existed at some point between now and the initial 10,000 ancestral population some 200,000 years ago. This hypothesis maintains that the Y chromosomal Adam and mitochondrial Eve are the offspring of other Homo sapiens, but that we all can trace our lineage back to them. This has been suggested by analyzing the Y chromosomes and the empty DNA of human samples from across the globe. It is estimated that the Y chromosomal atom existed 100,000 years ago and the mitochondrial Eve existed 200,000 years ago. Other recent studies have placed the Y chromosomal atom closer to 200,000 years ago. Essentially, what this means is that all living humans could share a common male and female ancestor, even if those ancestors were not the only living beings at that time and even if those two did not mate with each other. Beyond this, scientists have also posited the idea of the MRCA, a most common recent ancestor. This suggests that there is a common ancestor for all living humans today that is more recent than the Y chromosomal Adam and mitochondrial Eve. This estimation is more recent because it looks at both matrilineal and patrilineal lines. According to mathematical estimations and computer simulations, again based on estimated rates of mutation, the MRCA could have lived as recently as two to 5,000 years ago. In short, the high likelihood that all humans in existence today have a recent common ancestor is not an idea foreign to evolutionary biologists, nor is it considered outrageous or impossible. It is highly likely and even probable according to analyses of human DNA. B. Quranic discussions and conflicts with human evolutionary ancestry. The DNA analysis discussed above raises questions about the possibility of other contributors beyond Adam and Eve to humanity's current DNA pool. According to calculations and patterns observed in human beings, evolutionary biologists argue that it is impossible for us to have descended from only two individuals 10,000 years ago. This idea is in stark contrast with the idea that Adam and Eve are the sole progenitors of mankind, an idea explicitly mentioned in the Ahadith corpus and implied in Quran 4.1, quoted here again for ease of reference. The Quran reads, O mankind, be wary of your Lord who created you all from a single soul and created its mate from it, and from the two of them scattered numerous men and women. End quote. It is with regards to this verse that commentators of the Quran enter the discussion of the lineage of mankind. If all of us are solely the offspring of Adam and Eve, then who could their children have mated with except for each other? To keep the statement true to its absolute literal haqiqi meaning from the dual pronoun humma, the only possibility would be incest, an act strongly despised and explicitly forbidden in all Abrahamic religions. This is the explanation that many Christian theologians and Muslims have given with support from the Ahadith literature, though with less support from Twelver Shia Ahadith. Allama Tabatabai, Ayatollah Nasir Makaram Shirazi, and Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli all contend that the presence of the dual pronoun Humma indicates that there was no third party involved in the spread of mankind. Had there been other third parties involved, a plural pronoun would have been more appropriate as opposed to the dual. As such, they take the Zahir prima facie hariri literal meaning of the verse as a strong piece of evidence that conclude that incest is the likelier possibility. These are not the only explanations that exegetes have brought forth to elaborate how mankind spread from Adam and Eve. As mentioned in part 1, it is possible to move away from a prima facie Zahir interpretation in the case that there is reason to do so, like additional context, siyak, and other indicators, qara'in. Reasons to move away from a prima facie understanding include the Ahadith literature and possibly the genetic data we explored earlier. 
there is a group of ahadith narrated from the imams that explicitly and vehemently deny incest and mention that God is more powerful than to procreate mankind through an incestuous relationship. They go on to say that God sent down a jinn and a hoda in the shape of women to mate with the sons of Adam. Because of this, some have concluded that the ahadith insinuating incest were said out of taqiyya, dissimulation. However, Alama Tabatabai and Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli reject the ahadith asserting reproduction with non-humans on the basis they are not in line with the apparent prima facie, dhahiri, literal haqiqi meaning of the verse. They argue that incestuous relationships between the children of Adam were not necessarily problematic because at the time there were no legal stipulations against it. In their view, there is not sufficient evidence to reject prima facie literal reading of the Qur'an. Neither Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli nor Allama Tabatabai use the ahadith literature to extrapolate meaning from the verse. This is due to their hermeneutical policy, in which they do not use uncertain ahadith literature for exegesis. The only ahadith that they use are traditions that have reached the level of qat, i.e. there is a high level of certainty in their reliability.